Good morning. I'm Amanda McMillan, President and CEO of United Way of Greater Houston. Thank you for joining us this morning to hear from Dr. Stephen Kleinberg, who has just released his new book, Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. We would love to see you all in person this morning, but given the pandemic, we're still excited to have you all joining us virtually. While we are here to talk about Dr. Kleinberg's new book, I would be remiss if I didn't address the climate we're in and United Way's role in helping our community through these challenging times. As many of you know, United Way of Greater Houston joined forces with the Greater Houston Community Foundation to fundraise for those in our community impacted by the pandemic. And we thank so many of you who have supported this effort. To date, we have raised almost $17 million. This support is providing basic needs like food and rental assistance and other emergency assistance to those who need it most. So far, the Fund Task Force has deployed more than $12 million in grants and is working quickly to deploy more. Our collaboration on the Greater Houston COVID-19 Recovery Fund is a great example of how this community comes together in tough times and of United Way's role as a leader and convener in times of disaster. Our 211 Texas United Way helpline has answered more than 140,000 COVID-19 related calls from those in our community seeking assistance and it continues to connect those in need with help and hope 24 seven. Not to steal his thunder, but you will hear Dr. Kleinberg talk about Houston's growing opportunity gap where so many members of our community don't have access to the education or skills training they need to get good stable jobs. We know that before the pandemic, over 40% of families in our community were working hard, but still struggling to make ends meet. Those numbers are surely larger now creating an even greater opportunity gap. These socioeconomic challenges also overlap substantially with race. Much of Dr. Kleinberg's survey data shows us just how much work we all have to do to create a truly inclusive and just society. There's a quote by Abraham Lincoln at the beginning of chapter 13 of Dr. Kleinberg's book that feels particularly appropriate right now. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. The research from Dr. Kleinberg's annual surveys has helped shape United Way's strategic direction and our work going forward. The needs across the greater Houston area are indeed greater than ever. And serving those needs is exactly why United Way is here. As we approach our second century of service, United Way of Greater Houston is laser focused on helping more people be able to participate meaningfully in our economy over time by breaking down barriers for hardworking families struggling to achieve financial stability. We stand united with our friends, donors, volunteers, partners, and affiliates to make our community a place where everyone can thrive. Now on with the show. We are honored to have Houston native and award-winning journalist Melanie Lawson as our moderator this morning. Let me share a few words about Melanie before we start the program. As many of you already know, journalism has always been in Melanie's blood. She started as a full-time general assignments reporter at Channel 13, then went on to become the co-anchor of Live at 5 and Channel 13's midday show, Eyewitness News at 11 a.m. She has covered virtually every city, state, and national election during her career. She's won numerous awards for her reporting, including three Emmys. Melanie has interviewed a wide range of notables, including three U.S. presidents, the Dalai Lama, Maya Angelou, Beyonce, and many, many more. But Melanie's favorite stories are those about Houston's rich, multi-ethnic community, especially stories about children and those quietly working to make a difference in their lives, which made Melanie the perfect fit to moderate this interview with Dr. Kleinberg. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Amanda, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. I am just delighted to be here today, well, to be here virtually, along with United Way donors and friends, as we join in a fascinating conversation with Dr. Stephen Kleinberg to discuss his new book. It is called Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. 
Uh, now, I, I have to tell you, I've known Dr. Kleinberg for quite a long time. I've been fortunate to cover him as well as to get to know him as a friend and to follow his amazing surveys over the years. Um, I, I, it has become required reading and certainly required attendance for business and political leaders who are also educators, medical pro- personnel. Uh, everyone needs to know what Dr. Kleinberg is talking about from year to year. I've also seen his predictions turn out to be pretty accurate over the decades. And as a journalist, I always appreciate just how clear and accessible he is in terms of his writing as well as his presentations. Now, I want to introduce him to you and tell you a little bit about Dr. Kleinberg. He is the founding director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research and a professor emeritus of sociology at Rice University. He's been shaping local thought on the ongoing trends in the Houston metropolitan region for almost 40 years now. As the director of the annual Kinder Houston Area Survey, which started in 1982, shortly after he moved to Houston and ended in 2020, or is up to 2020, it's going to go on. He has tracked the economic outlooks, the demographic patterns, the experiences, and the beliefs of the people of Houston during a period of remarkable change for our city. Now, Dr. Kleinberg is the recipient of 12 major teaching awards and is a much sought after speaker, not only in the Houston community, but from far beyond as well. He is a graduate of Haverford College and holds an MA from the University of Paris and a PhD from Harvard University. He and his wife, Margaret, have lived in Houston since the early 1970s. They have two children and five grandchildren. Uh, And we want to welcome Dr. Kleinberg today. Now, your book presents fascinating and groundbreaking research that shows how Houston has emerged as a bellwether for America's future, based on your 38-year study of Houston's changing economic, demographic, and cultural landscapes. Uh, We're going to get a chance to hear your presentation first, to hear how he came to Houston and the journey of his research at the Kinder Institute. He's going to hit some of the highlights of his research and give us the cliff notes from his book, covering insights on Houston's history, which is just a remarkable uh, uh, look back at our city, remarkable changes in demographic patterns, economic outlooks, experiences, attitudes, and the beliefs of Houstonians. And then when we say the last few moments of this program, so we get a chance to hear uh, him answer some questions, not only from me, but from uh, some of you as well. So we will begin with Dr. Kleinberg. Oh, thank you all so much. It's a great pleasure to be here and, and uh, delighted to be able to share with you what, we, what we've finally put into a book called Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America that has tracked the remarkable changes of the city and that underline how important United Way is in building the city of the 21st century. So we started the survey back in 1982. Houston was booming. One million people had moved into Houston between 1970 and 1982, coming at the rate of 1,380 people a week, 230 cars and trucks every day being added to the streets and freeways of Harris County. Greatest boom anyone had seen, brought about by the tenfold increase in the value of oil. This was a one-company town riding the resource of the industrial age to continued prosperity. Price of a barrel of oil was $3.20 in 1970, going to 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. We were building and borrowing on the basis of $50 oil. We did a one-time survey to measure how are people balancing this incredible growth with growing concerns about traffic, pollution, crime. What kind of city are we building with all this affluence? A one-time survey, two months later, the oil boom collapsed. Price of oil, they're going to $37.50, suddenly dropped down to $28. By the end of 1983, 100,000 jobs were lost in this booming city. We said, we better do this survey again. And for 39 years, taking a representative random sample of Harris County residents, reached by random telephone numbers, half by cell phone, half by landline, asking people with identical questions over the years, how do you see the world? What is happening in your life? And we have sat back and watched the world change. Houston went to major recession and then recovered into the central phenomena and realities of the 21st century across all of America. Uh, Three fundamental changes I want to touch on very quickly here in terms of what has happened and how are people responding to it. Number one, of course, a new economy where the good blue collar jobs have disappeared. The source of wealth has less to do with natural resources and more to with human resources. Growing inequalities across the board in this city and country predicated above all else on access to quality education. 
Theme number two, a truly epic transformation in the demographic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. Why here? Why now? And then thirdly, of course, the new awareness of the importance of quality of place. The old, in the old days, Houston was world famous for having imposed the least amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. Who cares if it's ugly? So what if it smells? It's a smell of money. Now recognizing that if Houston's going to make it, it has to become a destination of choice, a place where the best and the brightest people in America will say, I want to live in Houston, Texas. So let me touch quickly on these three fundamental transformations that are the story of Houston, and indeed the story of America, as the 21st century unfolds. The new economy. Here are the 30 years after World War II, when the rising tide lifted all boats. This is a world, we emerged out of World War II, the sole economic power on the planet. All of our potential competitors were decimated by the war experience. This is a world of big business, big government, big labor. 38% of all the jobs in America were union jobs. The unions could negotiate with the corporations to ensure that workers shared in the prosperity of the companies. And the rising tide lifted all boats. Uh, the average American male, whatever his education, literally doubled his income in real terms between 1950 and 1970. And those were the years when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children on average, and the baby boom was launched upon the land, preceded and followed by baby bus generations, so for 65 years, there's been this bulge going through the American system. Demographers talk about it like a pig being swallowed by a python. Not very comfortable either for the pig or the python. The leading edge of those 76 million babies, overwhelmingly Anglo babies, that's who was here to be born in that period after World War II. The leading edge of those 76 million babies turned 74 this year. And we are going to watch a literal doubling of the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. And by, the, by, by 2035, the youngest of the 76 million will have turned 65, heading off into the proverbial sunset, being replaced by a very different generation of Americans. It's a truly epic transformation occurring across all of America, nowhere more clearly seen than here in Houston, Texas. So this was the 30 years after World War II. Here are the last 35 years when virtually all the benefits of economic growth have gone to the richest 20% of Americans. The bottom 60% of all American households, after finding their incomes doubling in the, in the 30 years preceding, basically stagnated in their income over the last 35 years. And all the wealth has gone to the richest 5%, the richest 1% in a striking redistribution of earnings out of the hands of the poor and the middle class into the hands of the rich and the super rich. What happened? Why did the economy change so profoundly? Lots of things happened, but two big things, big secular transformations. One was, is, of course, globalization. Companies can now produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you are doing a job that I can train a third world worker to do, and I pay that third world worker $15 a day, I'm not going to pay you $15 an hour. And if you are doing a job that I can program a computer to do, we're just at the beginnings of the robotics revolution, I will soon be replacing your job with an intelligent machine. We are in a new world where education, always a nice thing to have, has become absolutely essential to a person's ability to earn enough money to support a family in the new global knowledge economy of the 21st century. And, and here's one piece of evidence for what we're talking about. This is the education requirements for jobs in America uh, since 1970, uh, compiled by the uh, Georgetown uh, Center for Education and, and, and the Workforce. In, in 1973, there were 91 million jobs in this country. Of those 91 million jobs, one-third you were eligible for as a high school dropout. Another 40% required no more than high school. 75% of all the jobs in America required high school or less. And here's what happened, what's happened to American jobs uh, since then. And by the end of 2020, the estimates are 65% of all the jobs that exist in America will require education beyond high school. Not necessarily four years of college, but one or two years in a community college to acquire the technical skills that enable you to get the jobs that are now increasing in shortage of skilled welders, skilled electricians, skilled health technicians, skilled plumbers to acquire one or two years after high school. The critical requirement now is, is 14 years of education to prepare for even the, the basic jobs of the 21st century. If you graduated from high school, have no more than a high school diploma, 
and you don't have special skills as an artist or a performer or an athlete, and you just say, put me to work, America, you're going to have enormous difficulty finding a job in this country. And if you find a job, it will not pay you enough to support a family. The only way to improve the lot of the poor is to invest in their skills, to ensure that American children and young people are prepared to succeed in the new economy of the 21st century. And the public is understanding this. Here's one of the striking findings. We started back in 1995 asking this question, which comes closest to your feelings about the public schools in Houston? The schools have enough money, if it was used wisely, to provide a quality education, or the schools will need significantly more money to provide a quality education, if it was used wisely. That's what we always believe. There's plenty of money being spent on education. It's just being wasted. And that's what people believed in the 19, 1990s. First two years of, the, of that question, the majority were saying the schools have all the money they need, they're wasting it, and only a minority of 39 to 40 percent said the schools will need significantly more money. During the first decade of the 20th century, it was a 50-50 split. So we sort of stopped asking the question, and then 10 years later said, we better check this question again. And in 2018, suddenly now, the clear majority are saying the schools will need significantly more money, came back in the survey this year, and clearly, 55% to 39% saying the schools will need significantly more money to provide a quality education. This is a sea change in the public's understanding of how critical education is and how much Houston and Texas are having to play catch up. Houston, Texas is, is at the bottom of the 50 states and is spending on education. They didn't need education to make money in Texas. The big fortunes in Texas were made from land, cotton, timber, cattle, sugar, oil. We are now in a new world where the source of wealth from now on will have less and less to do with natural resources and more to do with human resources, with theoretical knowledge and technical skills. And that's where Houston and Texas have to play catch up to make it, and the general public understands that. Here's another surprise from, from the, the surveys. We asked this question, we said, what about, are you in favor or opposed to increasing local taxes in order to provide universal preschool education for every child in Houston? Increasing local taxes. Again, you start a question with that. Whoa, no. And we were really surprised two years ago in 2018 to find that the vast majority, 40% strongly, 27%, 67% saying, I'm in favor of increasing local taxes, provide universal preschool education. Came back two years later, and it's even more strong now. It's at 70% to just 28% uh, saying, uh, I'm in favor of increasing local taxes to provide quality preschool education. Public is absolutely right on this. One of the moments of truth in American education is third grade reading. If you're not reading at the third grade level in third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the single most powerful predictor whether you can read at third grade level is did you start kindergarten ready to learn to read? The brain is growing by 60% between ages zero and six. That's when all the synapses are forming. When, when you're exposed to letters and, and, and numbers and you're ready to learn, rich kids in Houston start kindergarten one and a half to two years ahead of poor kids. And that gap is central to the challenges that Houston faces today. Universal preschool education is a critical need as we, as we build the Houston of the 21st century. And we are behind both Dallas and San Antonio in our abilities, in the percentage of, of children in need who, have, who are given access to quality preschool education when that brain is growing so rapidly, when preparation for schools are, is, is so critical. Uh, and the, the reality of Houston, the central challenge laid bare by the pandemic that we've seen is the deepening inequalities between rich and poor across this city, now predicated above all else on quality education. And here are just some examples of that poverty. One of the questions we asked last year that said, supposing you had to come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense, how would you deal with that situation? Would you be able to pay for it out of savings? Would you need to borrow it? Or would you not be able to come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense? And in our sample in 2019, almost 40%, 39% of everybody in the survey said they could not come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense. 40% of us living on the edge, just one terrible disease away from abject poverty. Houston has the greatest medical complex in the world, and the Texas Medical Center, the largest, the 49, 49 different institutions, 100,000 doctors and scientists working at the medical center. We have the greatest medical complex in the world, and we have the highest percentage of children without health insurance of any major city in America. In our surveys, fully one-fourth 
said they and their family did not have any health insurance whatsoever. One third have household incomes of less than 37,000. Another one third said they had difficulty paying for the groceries to feed their families. And one third had difficulty paying for the housing that they needed for their families and, and for themselves. Deepening inequalities predicated, as I say, above all else on access to quality education. And this is something new in, in Houston. There were good blue collar jobs. The big employers in the 1970s was Hughes Two Company, Cameron Ironworks. You could drop out of high school with a strong right arm and expect to be able to make a middle-class wage. You could become a rust about in the oil fields. Those jobs have disappeared and the inequalities are palpable. And the public is understanding that people are poor today through no fault of their own. Here's a series of questions we've We've asked over the years. That again was a somewhat of a surprise. Support for government programs to reduce the inequalities here. Are several of them. Uh, you, do you agree or disagree? Government should take action to reduce income differences between rich and poor in America. Uh, do you agree or disagree? Government should see to it that everyone who wants to work can find a job. Uh, do, uh, are most people on welfare, receiving welfare benefits, really in need of help, or are they taking advantage of the system? percent saying they're really in need of help has gone from 31% to 47%. And then finally, are you in favor or opposed to federal health insurance to cover the medical expenses of all Americans? Not dramatic, but unmistakable, consistent, increasing recognition. People are poor in this city and country through no fault of their own, but because of structural barriers, above all education and all the support systems that make education possible. That is the critical challenge. And it's again why United Way is so important in helping to turn around the, these, these trends and providing opportunities for folks who are born in, in situations that lock them out of, out of those opportunities on their own. Theme number one, growing inequalities across the board in Houston and Texas and America predicated above all else on access to quality education. Theme number two, this truly remarkable, fundamental, irreversible transformation in the ethnic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. Why here? Why now? Here's a quick history lesson. This is the, the number of documented immigrants coming to America in each of the decades from the 1820s to 2010. Uh, and uh, the big story in our lifetimes is that between 1492 and 1965, 82% of all the human beings on the face of this earth who came to America, 82% came from Europe. Another 12% were Africans originally brought here as slaves to serve the Europeans. There's a handful of Chinese and Japanese working as farmers and laborers in, in California and Hawaii. This nation was an amalgam of European nationalities, deliberately so. We were operating under the last 40 years of that period, between 1924 and 1965, under one of the most viciously racist laws the U.S. Congress ever passed, the National Origins Quota Act. And it came out of the great anti-immigrant racist backlash that accompanied the last great wave of immigration when 15.9 million immigrants came to America between 1890 and 1914. 15.9 million coming from Europe, but not coming from Northern Europe. They were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. And they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews, and they had no history of democracy to come and take our jobs and destroy our country. We've got to stop them. And in 1924, we enacted this incredible act that basically said, from now on, only Northern Europeans will be allowed to come to America. Uh, you can see what happens to immigration. It plummets. That's the Great Depression in the 1930s, followed by World War II, the terrible aftermath of World War II. We thought immigration had ended. That racist law could not survive the shifts of consciousness of the civil rights movements. Kennedy's assassination, Jack Kennedy was the great champion of immigration. Last book published that he was re revising and was published after he was assassinated was entitled A Nation of Immigrants, a celebration of how much immigration had brought to America. And largely in tribute to him in 1965, Congress changed the law thinking nothing would change, saying, okay, we used to be a racist nation. We're not racist anymore. We'll give every country recognized by the UN 20,000 visas a year. So get off my back. We're not racist. But we're going to continue the hallmark of American immigration policy, which is family reunification. We think immigration has ended, but if it hasn't, we're going to give preference to people who are related to those who are already here. So nothing is going to change, we thought. Then they added another provision. They said, well, if you're a professional of exceptional ability, if you have skills that are demonstrably needed in short supply, you too can come to the head of the line. And Congress, in its debates in the 1950s and early 60s, was saying, we need to open the door for some more British doctors, some more German engineers. It never occurred to anyone that there were going to be African doctors, Indian engineers, 
Chinese computer programmers, Filipino nurses, who would be able for the first time in the 20th century to come to America. The law was changed in 1965. It's been called one of the great inadvertent acts that the U.S. Congress has ever passed in a body, of course, known for its inadvertent acts and its unintended consequences. We thought nothing would change. Everything changed. During the 1960s, three and a half million immigrants came to this country. Only 38% were from Europe. 1970s, five million came. Only 18% were Europeans. 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, 10 million immigrants per decade have been coming to America. 88% of all the new immigration into America since the change in law in 1965, we've become a nation of immigrants again. 88% are coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. And the United States, that throughout all of our history had been an amalgam of European nationalities, is becoming a microcosm of the world. The first nation in the history of the world that can say we are a free people and we come from everywhere. That's a truly remarkable moment. I mean, the same moment as American economy is becoming fully integrated in a single global world economic system. America now a microcosm of all the world's ethnicities and religions. Immigration is, of course, network driven. You go where you know people, so it's not happening at the same rate everywhere. The big immigration capital of America in terms of sheer numbers is, of course, New York City, followed by Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, followed right after Chicago by Houston, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and then Dallas, San Diego, Boston, Atlanta, spreading out to every city and town across America. No city has been transformed as rapidly, as suddenly, as irreversibly as Houston, Texas. This city throughout all of our history was essentially a biracial southern city dominated and controlled in an automatic, taken-for-granted way by white men. In the last 35 years, has become the single most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the entire country. Here are the census figures for Harris County between 1960 and 2010. In 1960, there were 1.243 million people living in Harris County, Texas. This was our biracial world in 1960. 74% of us were Anglos, 20% African Americans, 6% Hispanics, less than one half of 1% were Asians. During the oil boom years of the 60s and 70s, it was Anglos pouring into Houston from everywhere else in the country. This is where the jobs were. By 1980, Houston had become the fourth largest city in America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo city. After the oil bust of 1982, the Anglo population of Harris County stopped growing. And all the growth of this, the most rapidly growing city in America, has been the influx of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. Here are the last three full decades of the, of the census. Uh, and you can see the Anglo population stabilizes and then drops slightly. The African American population keeps growing at the rate of about 20% per decade, keeping pace with the population as a whole, fueled by Jamaican and African immigration, fueled by the great remigration of middle-class African Americans who go to northern cities in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, coming back to southern cities, Atlanta first, Houston second, African American population keeping pace, and surging populations of Latinos and Asians. And the latest figures for the census are that Harris County is now 42% Hispanic, 31% Anglo, 19% African American, 8% Asian. Wow. No city has been transformed as rapidly, as fully, as completely as Houston, Texas. Just imagine how different the story of Houston would have been had we not become one of the magnets for the new immigration of the last, of the last 35 years. Houston would have lost population. We would have had the same fate as other major American cities across the country that are losing their status as major cities because for 35 years they have essentially stopped growing. Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Instead, Houston is one of the most vibrant, rapidly growing cities in America, purely because of the tremendous energy, vitality, commitment to hard work of immigrants pouring into this city from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. No city has benefited more from immigration than Houston, Texas. And it's ironic, but I guess not surprising to see anti-immigrant attitudes in Houston when you think how critical this has been to Houston's story, how different the story of Houston would have been. Had we been like Philadelphia as we were in 19, 1981, same size, for one reason or another, Philadelphia never became the magnet for the new urban growth of America in the 21st century. Uh, and, and here's a way to envision this. This is Harris County in 1980. 
There are 1,320 census tracts in Harris County, and in blue are all the census tracts in 1980 that had majority Anglo populations. In red are the census tracts of a majority African American. That's basically the African American corridor in the inner city, the third ward and the fifth in the fifth ward. And on the ship channel was a segundo barrio in orange where the Latinos were, and then a few places around the Beltway in that olive color with no majority. Here's 1990, here's 2000, and here's 2010. Isn't that amazing? With no one having planned this, no one consulted with me before all these people came, Houston finds itself at the forefront of the demographic transformation that's occurring across all of America, nowhere more clearly seen than in Houston, Texas. And here's why we claim that Houston is the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in the country. How do you measure the ethnic diversity of a population? Well, there are two standard ways. One is simply, what's the percentage of Anglos? The fewer Anglos, the more diverse. But a better way, we think, uh, is what's called the entropy index. How close does a population come to equal force? One-fourth Asian, one-fourth Latino, one-fourth African-American, one-fourth Anglo. And by that measure, Houston just beats out New York as the most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the country. Here is Harris, the greater Houston metropolitan area. Here are the eight other, seven other most diverse large metropolitan areas in the country. And you can see that all the successful urban areas in, the, in America have been successful in large part because they have been magnets for the new immigration of the last 35 years. But Los Angeles has proportionally too few African Americans. Chicago has too many Anglos. Miami has too few African, too few Asians. Houston is where the four communities meet in greater balance, greater equality, all of us minorities, all of us called on to build something that has never existed before in human history. A truly successful, inclusive, equitable, united, multi-ethnic society made up of all the peoples, all the ethnicities, all the religions of the world gathered together in one remarkable place. It is the story of Houston in the 21st century. And it's a reason why this city matters in building in the America that will emerge as the 21st century unfolds. And we've been tracking attitudes and perceptions and across the board in all of our surveys, alternating years, increasingly positive views. Here are the examples from the survey of this year. One of the questions we asked was, uh, do you agree or disagree? Ref refugees who are in danger in their home countries should always be welcome in Houston, went from 64% to 76 and then to 77%. Uh, we had said, here's a 10-point scale where one means very unfavorable feelings, 10 means very favorable feelings. Where on this scale would you, would you put your feelings about undocumented immigrants? And you can see the increasingly positive views. And then where on this scale would you put your feelings about Muslims or followers of Islam? And once again, increasingly positive views. And in alternating years, do you think the increasing ethnic diversity in Houston will eventually become a source of great strength for the city or a growing problem? Does the new immigration into American society today mainly strengthen American culture or threaten American culture? In all those questions, increasingly positive views, increasing embrace of the diversity of Houston as we realize this is who we are as the 21st century unfolds. And tied into this is increasing comfort with this, this new reality that is Houston. One of the classic measures of generalized trust, we said, do you think that most people can be trusted or you can't be too careful in dealing with people? And you can see gradual but unmistakable, increasingly positive feelings that most people can be trusted. Uh, how worried are you that you or a member of your family will be the victim of a crime has gone down to the lowest level in all the years of our surveys. And uh, are you in favor of post of the death penalty? Or, or what's the appropriate punishment for, for someone con uh, convicted of, of first-degree murder? The death penalty, life imprisonment with no possibility of parole, or life imprisonment with a possibility for parole after 25 years. The percent who keep calling for the death penalty has gone down consistently and powerfully. In this, traditionally, one of the death penalty capitals of America. Again, a kind of a new, new openness, a new acceptance, a new embrace of who we are becoming and, and why this makes Houston a much more interesting and richer and more, more varied place. Houston is one of the best places in America, as we all know, to eat out in, largely because of the tremendous contributions of all the different cultures and cuisines that have made Houston their home. Uh, and, and again, a reminder of the terrible inequalities in Houston that are 
powerfully associated with ethnicity. So here are, are five different groups, U.S.-born Anglos, all Asians in Houston, U.S.-born Blacks, U.S.-born Hispanics, and Hispanic immigrants, uh, percent who have less, less, no more than a high school diploma, the uh, household incomes below 37,000, uh, Professor Sanders said they had a problem buying the groceries to feed their families. You can see this striking differentiation that we've been picking up and seeing and, and, and that the pandemic has made so powerfully clear to all of us. Here are a few others about health disparities. Here's a percent who could not come up with $400 to meet an emergency expense. Here's a, here's a percentage who, had, who's, who said their families have no health, health, health insurance. And then we asked people the classic question about, is your current state of health these days Excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. The percent who said my current state of health is only fair or poor is twice as high among African Americans and, and Latinos, even though they are much younger on average than the Anglos and the Asians. And it's a reminder that, as again, powerfully clear by, by the experience of this pandemic, the differential vulnerabilities that, that this poverty creates in dealing with the challenges of, of the pandemic, the, the economic shutdown, the collapse of oil prices that is the triple whammy that Houston is facing in today's world. And here is uh, the most powerful relationship, I think, the, the relationship between age and ethnicity. So let's see, I've got babies on the left and old people on the right. I've got 12 different age categories from under the age of five to age 75 and older. And here from the latest census is where the Anglos are in Harris County, Texas today. Ladies and gentlemen, the baby boom. It's not until you reach people in Harris County age 63 and older that the majority of folks are still Anglos. And at each younger age group, the percentage of Anglos plummets. The percentage of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians surges. This is, as I say, the baby boom experience of Anglos in disproportionately aged. Here's where everybody else is in Harris County, Texas today. So this is a powerful picture of Houston's present and future of everybody in Harris County, not inner city Houston, not HISD, of, every, of all the 4.8 million who live in Harris County, of the 1.3 million who are under the age of 20, who will be the workers and taxpayers and voters and citizens of Houston and Texas in the 21st century, of everybody under the age of 20 in all of Harris County, 51% are Latinos, 19% are African Americans, 9% are Asians, a grand total of 21% of everybody under 20 is Anglo. So two big points to make here. Of everybody under the age of 20, 70% are African American and Latino. The two groups overwhelmingly the most likely to be living in poverty. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public school systems. It is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African American and Latino young people are unprepared to succeed, in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is difficult, if not impossible, to envision a prosperous future for Houston. That is who we are and will be as the 21st century unfolds. And the other point to make is that this is a done deal. Close the borders, build your fence, close off America, round up those 10 million people you think are illegally and send them wherever you think they're supposed to go, seal off this country so not another immigrant or refugee sets foot on this land. 63-year-old Anglos are not going to be making a whole lot more babies. I tell everybody, we'll do the best we can. We'll work on it every chance we get. You can go to the bank on this. No conceivable force in the world is going to stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more African-American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. Nothing in the world can stop that. So the only question our generation has been given is, Okay, how do we make this work? How do we ensure that this diversity becomes the greatest asset that Houston could have as it positions itself in the global economy, second largest port in the country, the gateway to the global marketplace, and make sure it doesn't end up tearing us apart and becoming a major liability, reducing rather than enhancing our competitiveness in the global economy? Much depends on how this generation speaks to this remarkable convergence of the two forces that have transformed the 21st century in our lifetimes a new economy where education has suddenly become critical, and a demographic revolution. And again, it seems to me unmistakably clear how important the work of the United Way and all of its agencies is 
in addressing those issues and improving our prospects for success in the 21st century. And so that was Houston. Here's the United States. So the same pattern of, of the aging of Anglos, but the majority, this is still an, an Anglo country, right? Uh, very soon after we received this data, the census said, okay, everybody under the age of nine, age eight and younger across all of America, the majority are now African-American, Latino, and Asian. And they said, you want to see what America will look like in 2050? Let's assume virtually no immigration. So we'll go just by the, those damn actuarial tables. Here's what they say America looks like in 2050. This is very close to Houston today. It actually looks exactly like Texas today. Houston is where the American future is, is happening first. We are where all of America will be as the 21st century unfolds. By 2050, all of America will look like Houston looks today. We are there first. How we navigate this transition will have enormous significance, not just for the Houston future, but for the American future. This is where, for better or worse, the American future is going to be worked out. And it's what makes, I think, all of our efforts and commitments in Houston of transcendent importance. It's not just Houston's future we're dealing with here. This is where Houston can be or, or not be a model for what all of America can, will become as it looks more and more like Houston as the 21st century unfolds. So theme number three, this, room, this, this new importance of quality of place across the board. Okay, here, oh, oh, hiking, biking, this is just a reminder of how much we have improved this city and turned it into a far more attractive place than it was when all of our focus was on getting rich quick and riding the oil boom. What's going to be the source of Houston's wealth in the 21st century? Houston's location of the East Texas oil fields accounted for everything in Houston's prosperity in the 20th century is going to count for less and less and eventually for zilch in the 21st century. What will be the source of Houston's wealth? The answer will have something to do with that medical center, the largest medical complex on earth. Can we turn all that expertise into Houston becoming the third coast for the life sciences? It will have to do with, with the efforts to develop new high-tech uh, uh, ge uh, generation of, of technologies that will fuel the, the economic growth of the 21st century. The source of wealth for Houston in the 21st century will, will, will have to do with attracting the best and the brightest people in America, working at the cutting edge of knowledge. The resource of the knowledge economy is housed between the ears of the best and the brightest people in America who can live anywhere. And suddenly, quality of life issues, never important for Houston, have become central to the pro-growth agenda for the city in the 21st century. And here's again a reminder of, of how much we have been doing to improve the quality of life in the city over the last 15 to 20 years. Here's a reminder of why we flood, right? This is the, this is the, the, the 11 major bayous in Houston. A reminder also of one of the transformative events in Houston's history. Those bayous were concretized in the cheapest possible way by the Army Corps of Engineers to serve as drainage dishes for our flooding problems. That's what we did down here. No one thought of these as amenities of any value. We got flooding problems. We got these crummy creeks. Let's straighten them out, get the water out of here as fast as possible, dump it into the Galveston Bay and out, uh, out uh, into the ocean. We voted in 2012, the citizens of the city of Houston voted to tax ourselves $100 million to be matched by another $130 million in private monies to take the nine major bayous in Houston and turn them into 150 miles of linear parks. And by the, by the time the Bayou Greenways initiative was completed sometime toward the end of 2020, early 2021, 65% of everybody who lives within the boundaries of the city of Houston will be within walking distance of a bayou trail. Houston will become one of the greenest cities in America. That would have been inconceivable 15 or 20 years ago. This is a city self-consciously reinventing itself for the 21st century. Uh, and part of that new reality is, is that flooding is now a reality for us. It's not something that's gonna go away. It was not a one-time event. We, we asked a series of questions after Harvey, six months after Harvey hit in, in August of 2017. And then early in 2018, we said, uh, do you agree or disagree? It's, it is virtually certain that the Houston area will experience more severe floods in the next 10 years than in the, in the past 10. It went from 76 down to 75, no change. And then no change again to 77% in the survey this year. And then we asked this question. We said, are you in favor or opposed to 
to prohibiting any additional construction in areas that have repeatedly flooded, dropped from 71 to 56 percent. We thought it would keep going down, and instead it came back up to 65 percent three years after after the Harvey the Harvey deluge. Uh, and here's one other piece of evidence that we were we see a different world today. These are two questions about climate change. In this, the oil and gas capital of America, uh, we said, how serious a threat do you think is climate change? And the percent saying it's a very serious problem went from 30% moving back and forth to 52, 51% in the survey this year. And then the other question was, do you believe that climate change is primarily caused by human activities or by normal climate cycles? And the percent saying it's human activities burning of fossil fuels, the need to find a way to, to capture and sequester the carbon dioxide, the percent saying it's due to human activities was just 40, 48%, and then 54, 60, 61, 65, 69% in the survey this year, reflecting a new understanding that we live in a different world today, a world that isn't just problematic for one time or another, but where Flooding is going to be a part of our lives and part of Houston's story for the rest of its time in the, on this planet. And we need to find ways to increase our resiliency and, and, and move toward energy, be, uh, renewable, non-fossil non fuel-based energy. And you can see the city beginning seriously to address those questions as the general public shifts in its understanding of these issues. I want to show you one final piece of, uh, of, of the shifts that are going on in public attitudes, and then I'll stop and open it to questions and thoughts. Houston is, by some measures, the single most spread out, the least dense, the most automobile dependent city in all of America. The city of Houston covers 600 square miles and has a grand total of 2.2 million people living in those 600 square miles. Do you know how big that is? You could put inside the city limits of Houston simultaneously, I kid you not, the cities of Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, and Philadelphia. Those four cities cover the same geographical space as the city of Houston, and they contain among them five and a half million people. The city of Houston contains just 2.2 million. And then you go out to the Greater Houston metropolitan area, the CMSA of Houston, the, the nine county area, there's ha Harris County in the middle, southwest of us is Fort Bend County. I forgot to mention, we think Fort Bend County is the most ethnically diverse county on this planet. Fort Bend County today is 21% Asian, 24% Latino, 20% African American, 33% Anglo. You can't come much closer to one fourth, one fourth, one fourth than that. Meanwhile, Montgomery County, north of us, is by some measures the third most Republican county in America. We, we em embrace all kinds of people in this broad basin. But the greater Houston metropolitan area covers over 10,000 square miles. That is almost as large as the entire state of Massachusetts and considerably larger than the state of New Jersey. This is the blob that ate East Texas. Houston was built on a crummy little bayou, 50 miles from any natural barrier in any direction. No mountains, no forests, no rivers, a developer's dream built by Ford on behalf of the automobile, made possible by air conditioning, and we spread everywhere. And we have created a civilization totally predicated on the automobile. We've been asking people in our surveys, if you could live any way you wanted in Houston, what would you prefer? And over the years, here's what we found. So this is, you know, what kind of, what, uh, is a preference, what kind of neighborhood would you like to live in? A single family residential area or an area with a mix of developments, including shops, workplaces, and restaurants? And it was over these years a 50-50 split. And then we said, well, what kind of house would you like to live in? A single family home with a big yard where you would need to drive just about everywhere you want to go, or a smaller home in a more urbanized area within walking distance of shops and workplaces. And here again, it was a 50-50 split. And what's happening here, I think, we're asking how, what percentage of Houstonians are given the choice of living within walkable distance of shops and workplaces, maybe 10, 15 percent, 50 percent of Houstonians are saying, that's how I would like to live in Houston. And this is not, I think, anti-suburb or anti-sprawl. This is a reminder that we are a different folk than we were when we all went out to the suburbs and built this sprawling metropolis. In 1970, in the census of 1970, two-thirds of all American families had children living at home. This was still part of the baby boom. You have children at home, they need big spaces, they need green space. 
The suburbs were beckoning and building rapidly. We're out of here, right? In the, uh, in the, in the, in the, 2000, in the 2010 census, one third only of households had children at home. Census thinks by 2020, no more than about one fourth of all the households in America will have children living at home. Whole bunches of us are empty nesters. The kids have grown up and I'm in my late 40s, early 50s. I work downtown. I love the ballet and the symphony and the opera. Do I still want to have to drive two hours every day? Do I want to have to mow the lawn? Give me a choice, Houston. We think there'll be as many households consisting of a single person living alone than households with children at home. And we're trying to attract the the creative class, the millennial generation, sociologists talk about the millennials as the postponing generation. They seem to be in no rush to get married, to have babies, to turn us into grandparents. They don't want to be out in the suburbs. When they have children, they're going to have 1.6 children, not, not 3.4. Uh, they want all the variety, diversity, bar hopping that only urban life can provide. And the fastest growing age segment of the American population are men and women over the age of 80. That population is growing faster than any other population in the country. We have seen nothing yet as the baby boom generation turning 74 this year moves rapidly into senior status. I'm not sure I want all those 85 year olds having to drive everywhere in Houston, Texas. And so we are uh, reinventing ourselves as a city in a way that is just fascinating and important to realize we're in a new world today where the preferences and, and challenges and needs of today are radically different from what they had been when Houston moved into becoming the fourth, the fourth largest city in America at the end of the oil boom in the 19, 1980s. So let me conclude by just reminding us of some of the central new realities that these surveys have picked up over the years. Surveys have documented significant changes in area residents' understandings of the major issues and in their support for initiatives to improve the city's prospects. We can do things today there's a support for initiatives today that was when the support was not have been there five and 10 years ago. And now, especially as the region comes to grip with the triple whammy we were talking about, um, that is the short term challenges that we face. It's important, I think, to keep a focus on the longer term challenges as well. And that's what these surveys have picked up. We'll be back in the field uh, in February of 2021 to measure how has this pandemic and all the consequences of it changed us in our views of the world. But what we can already recognize is that the, the, the pandemic has accentuated the region's growing inequalities, laid bare their dire consequences. The area residents are increasing, increasingly acknowledge the need to improve the public schools, to spend more money if necessary, to redress the rising inequalities. They're calling for initiatives to mitigate future storms, to build more walkable neighborhoods, and they're embracing overwhelmingly clearly Houston's diversity. They have developed a deeper sense of trust and community solidarity. We are a different folk today than we were back in the in, uh, 10 or 15 or, or 20 years ago. And so, and what uh, remains to be seen, whether Houston's business and civic leaders can build on these attitude changes to make the critical investments that we need to make to position the city for prosperity. As the city copes with the daunting short-term challenges, it's good to be reminded of the key Way of the way in which area residents have changed over the years in their broader concerns, in their support for new longer term investments that will ultimately determine Houston's future and America's future in the 21st century. So I tell people, stay tuned. We'll be back in the field, as I say, in February of each of the following years, looking, watching this remarkable city coming to grips with the challenges of the 21st century. And again, recognizing how critical is the contribution that the United Way is making to strengthening our, our ability to address those issues and to build a successful city as we go forward. Thanks again very, very much for your attention and thank you for all your support of this tremendously important organization. Our report on the, on the, 20, on the 2020 survey is downloadable from the Kinder Institute. And of course, the book is now available. Go to Brazos Bookstore, go to any of the bookstores or, or, or Amazon.com and it gives a nice chance to sort of consolidate what we think we've learned just before the pandemic has hit and a chance to then pick up on those themes as we, as we go forward. Thanks again very much, and again, enormously grateful to you for all your support and help during all of these years. Well, first of all, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Kleinberg. This is uh, such an exciting chance to actually 
hear from him. And to mention that his book presents so many fascinating and really groundbreaking research that is in our city over decades now and how it's emerged as a real bellwether for America's future based on this long study, 38 years plus, Dr. Kleinberg. We'll get a chance to uh, not only chat with you and obviously hear the highlights of your research and kind of cliff's notes. We won't be able to get the whole book, but we'll get most of it. Uh, and then we save the last few minutes of the program so that he can answer a few questions, including some that were submitted by many of you. So, Dr. Kleinberg, it's great to get a chance to work with you again. You know, I always enjoy spending a few minutes with you. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, Melanie. It's wonderful to be with you. Yes, and we have to thank the United Way for bringing us together for this virtual date. That's pretty <laughs> exciting. Too. Well, uh, as a result of your presentations and, and, and of your surveys, what have you seen emerging as really kind of your major three themes, uh, beginning with education? Yeah, well, education is the big one. Right? I, I remind people, you didn't need education to make money in Texas. The great Texas fortunes were made from exploiting all you could do on the land. Cotton, timber, cattle, sugar, oil. The source of wealth in the 21st century will have less to do with natural resources, which is a basis for the wealth of Houston and Texas, and more to do with human resources, with knowledge and skills. And we have to play catch up because we have not made the investments in education that other states have made because we didn't think we needed it. That was not the basis for, for economic success. It is today, right? And, and what we're watching is growing in the Growing separation of opportunities predicated above all else on access to quality education and all the support systems that make education possible. Affordable housing, uh, minimum wage that keeps up with inflation, uh, access to health care. One fourth of all the young people in this city, despite having the greatest medical complex in the world, have no health insurance. One fourth of families. So it's that inequality predicated above all else on education that is really, I think, the great challenge. As we, as we embrace the diversity that, that is Houston and will be America as we go forward, it's it, the question of, of access to, to opportunity is going to be the central question of the 21st century. And then you basically have two other themes that you talk about. Mm. And one of those has to do, obviously, with race. And that has been sort of one of those issues that Houston has grappled with over the decades. Well, it was so striking and so unexpected for Houston is this was a biracial southern city dominated by white men. Mm -hmm. Both of Houston was Anglos pouring into the city during the 60s and 70s, 1982, when the oil boom collapsed. And Anglos stopped coming, and all the growth of this, the most rapidly growing city in America in the last 20, 35 years, has been the influx of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. And this biracial southern city has become the single most ethnically diverse major city in the country, all of America is going to look like Houston looks today in about 25 years. We are their first uh, remarkable sort of sense of Houston as the prophetic city. This is where the American future is going to be worked out. And, and on that score, we're doing pretty well. You can see the population increasingly uh, embracing the diversity. The single most powerful predictor among Anglos of comfort with diversity and support for immigration, the single most powerful predictor for Anglos is not gender, it's not education, it's age. Younger Anglos taking for granted this remarkable diversity that we older Anglos are struggling to accept. Right? So you can see that process of social change unfolding. And then the third great thing is that if Houston's going to make it in the 21st century, it has to turn itself into a destination of choice, a place where the best and the brightest people in America working at the cutting edge of knowledge, able to put that knowledge into commercial ventures, will say, I want to live in Houston, Texas. And that's a stretch for Houston. We don't have beautiful mountains. We don't have a lovely, lovely seasons. Uh, the whole, we never pay much attention to public, uh, to, uh, to public processes and public, public, public structures. The saying in the 70s was, who cares if it's ugly? So what if it smells? It's the smell of money. <laughs> Houston's future depends on becoming a much more attractive place. You can see the city making major investments in parks and 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 green spaces and, and uh, tremendous, of course, art and, and music and, and, and all the things that make cities attractive. Houston has, made, has, has done a lot, but has to do more in order to succeed. And you can see the city beginning to understand that and, and supporting the development of, of things that make this a much more attractive city to live in. So those are the three big stories of why and how Houston is a different place than it was 20 
than 30 years ago. And these surveys have just happened upon this process of remarkable change. I mean, they ask people identical questions over the years. How do you see the world? And then watching people answer those questions differently. And we're, in a, diff we're a different folk today in a different place with a different set of understandings than we had even 10, 10 or 15 years ago. To the best of your knowledge, are there any other cities out there who are really looking at their landscape from the same vantage point you are? Well, there are a lot of surveys that are done, uh, but none that we've been able to find. There's a, there's a national survey called the General Social Survey, That's sort of what we're doing, that picks up on, that asks identical questions over time. There used to be something called the Detroit Area Study, but that stopped. There was a, a, a Los Angeles County Survey, but it had different investigators each year asking different questions. So as far as we know, no, no one has really done this. And, it's, uh, uh, and I was able to do it partly because in the old days, it was much less expensive to do surveys of this sort. We all had landline phones that phone rings. You answer the damn phone. So it's a much more complicated business with cell phones, with answering machines, caller ID. Uh, but uh, so a lot of people have talked to me about wanting to replicate these surveys in Denver or in Dallas or in in, in, in Atlanta, and it's hard. It takes a couple of years of surveys of this sort until you realize this is really interesting and valuable. One-time survey, is that bigger or small? Is that higher or low? Is that good or bad? Watching it over time, and cities have been undergoing these tremendous changes. We're hoping that maybe having this book out can stimulate other, other cities to, to begin even now to, to do this because we're, in, we're going to be changing dramatically as a, as a country and as, as an urban urban world as the, as the 21st century unfolds. And that's where I want to jump in right now. I want to go back to the education gap mm -hmm. that you talked a moment ago, which is one of your primary themes and apparently has been throughout the life of the survey education. But you've talked a lot about the education gap by Houston, that now African Americans and Hispanic kids really are not prepared to succeed in the world and, that we and, now live. And they are in the future. Right, exactly. And especially since uh, the numbers are growing so quickly. In the new economy, how do you make them, as you refer to it, our kids, not just kids over there, but our kids and the understanding from, from citizens all over the city that what happens with those kids determines their future? Yeah, well, that's a beautiful question. It's part of the broader reality that, you know, when we were riding the oil boom during the first 80 years of the 20th century, you could not make money. I mean, and we didn't need to do anything to make money. You know, they used to say you could dress a gorilla in the business suit, send him downtown in the 1970s and become a millionaire in a week. <laughs> uh, we are now in a world where the future depends on us. We are, it's not going to happen automatically. And, and Houston has to play catch up because it didn't need to worry about education in the old days. And, and we're competing against, you know, no, there'll be no great cities in the 21st century that don't have great universities because that's going to be the source, that's where knowledge is produced. And, and Houston is going to become the third coast for the life sciences if we can harness the research that makes that, makes that possible. We're competing against, against LA that has Caltech and, and, and uh, USC and, US, and, and UCLA. We're competing against Boston that has MIT and Harvard and BC and BU. Houston has Rice, wonderful, but very small. And it's got the U of H, which is getting better, but it's still... A, a, a kind of urban university. We need to have research centers for that. And, and, and we also have, Stephen, uh, just to remind you, Texas Southern University, which educates yes. the largest number of African Americans and now Hispanics, and and then uh, several of the city colleges, if you will. So forgive me for interrupting. Oh, no, you bet. Well, I was just going to get to that. I mean, the two okay. challenges are number one, cutting edge scientific research that, that gets translated into, into commercial ventures. And, and then educating the broader us for, for the jobs in the 21st century. And one of the striking things I think I showed in that in the PowerPoint was the educational requirements for all the jobs that exist in America in the 1970s, 91 million jobs, three-fourths of which you could qualify for with a high school diploma or less. And now 65% of the jobs require education beyond high school. Right. That's the great challenge, right? And, and, and when you combine that with the, with the demographic shifts, these are our children. This is our future. This is who we are. We, it's, in, it's impossible to envision a prosperous future for Houston that doesn't ensure that African-American, Latino, young people acquire the skills that they need to, to qualify for the jobs of the 21st century. And, and that's a big change for Houston because 
The big employers was Hughes Tool Company, Cameron Ironworks. You could drop out of high school and become a rust about in the oil fields and be able to make a middle class wage. Those jobs have disappeared. So it, that's so that so education at both levels, at both the research level and and the preparation level, are are the critical questions for the Houston future. And it's up to us. And so if most of us continue to say these are not our children, it's not my responsibility, uh, Houston is not going to make it. It's only if we recognize this is who we are. And, and, and we're helped by the, the embrace of diversity that is also happening. So that the younger people, of course, and that's a whole other dynamic that we'll get to, I'm sure, but, but that's a big positive. If, these are not black kids out there that are not my... These are, this is part of, a, a, of our multi-ethnic family that you see increasingly developing in Houston that, that bodes well for the future, but it's going to require real, deliberate, sustained investments on the part of all of us to ensure that we're prepared for the 21st century. And that's the real question, isn't it? Not whether or not people agree with that, because as you say, more and more people agree now, but what comes next and the whole issue of, of uh, strategy and leadership, if you right. would talk just a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, again, that's the, the idea that, that uh, the future depends on us and depends on, on our recognition. And one of the, the surveys show quite surprisingly, I think, you know, that when you, I tell people, you know, don't blame me, I'm just asking the questions, hear the answers, and you see uh, the general public increasingly understanding these issues. What you don't see happening yet is translating that understanding into effective action. Houston always has problems in, in training. We all recognize the critical importance of, of quality preschool education for all of our kids. It's the best return on investment. It is central to kids starting kindergarten, prepared to learn to read and to move forward. Um, but Houston has, is doing much less well than either San Antonio or Dallas in ensuring that universal access to preschool education for all the kids in our city. So we understand it, but we haven't yet figured out a way to translate that into effective long-term investment and commitment. And that's going to be the question for Houston Future. I, I end the book saying, honestly, the jury is out. The jury is out for Houston, and ultimately the jury is out for America, because these are the same issues that all of America is facing. No one is yet, no city is a model yet of building for the 21st century in the way that, that these times demand of us. Yeah, as we've heard said often, education is the civil rights issue of our time yes, right now. Exactly. exactly. In a way that it was not necessarily before. I mean, it's really a new world yeah, that, yeah. We, that we yeah. need to grasp and, and build on. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about what you described as not an ethnic divide in Houston, but really a class divide above all. Uh, a lot of money concentrated in the, at the top with a few people and not as much an opportunity for so many others. So, when you talk about that class divide, does it mean that we are making any kind of progress or has our new economy, which is so dependent upon technology and, and knowledge in those fields, uh, is that really holding us back as a city? Well, the class divide, again, what we've just been saying, is predicated above all else on access to quality education. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's a division that happens in every community. Uh, the, the, the group that is suffering the most across America are white men with high school educations or less, living in small town or rural areas, who voted overwhelmingly for Trump, in fact. We'll have to see what happens in this next election. But this was, uh, these are folks, who, my father was in the, in, the, uh, in the steel mills, my grandfather was in the coal mines. Those jobs have disappeared. And, and uh, half, I'm sorry, white, poor whites with low levels of education are, are dying more rapidly than any other group from what are called the diseases of despair, suicide, drug addiction, obesity, that come from feeling that the world is passing, passing them by. So, that, so it's a division that is occurring in every community, a growing middle class and a growing underclass, simultaneously predicated above all else on access to quality education. And, and you can see, so it's, it's, racial divides are still very powerful, very real, we're coming out of a deeply racist world. One of, the, one of the other great events happening right around our time now is this growing recognition of, of the systemic racism that continues across America. Uh, what was striking, I think, was to see in this protest with the, the George Floyd murder that uh, this was not just blacks protesting. This was everybody. This was all of us. This was, this was 
that, that are affronted to Americans in a fundamental and powerful way that suggests, you know, we've got lots to do in terms of, of compensating for the systemic racism of America. But we're more prepared to do that now than ever before, I think, because there's a sense of solidarity. And the other piece of this is that we are falling in love with each other, marrying and making multiracial babies in a way that we've never seen before in American history. Of all the marriages in Houston involving a, 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 a 28% of all the married U.S. born Latinos in Houston, 28% are married to non Latinos. All the marriages involving an Asian in the last three years, one third involved a non Asian. There's been a 600% increase in black white marriages between 2010 and, and uh, between 1990 and, and, and 2010. We're moving into a transracial world. We're not there yet. But the real challenge is ensuring access to equal opportunity across the board in each of those, each of those communities. And it's a combination of, of it's what sociologists call eth class, a combination of eth ethnicity and class that underlie the inequalities in the country that need to be addressed if we're going to succeed. Uh, and you've moved nicely into the issue of race, and I want to come back to some of the protests in a moment. But when you talk about race here in Houston, I, I thought it was a fascinating study that you referred to in the book, uh, where you looked at neighborhoods and whether or not, you know, blacks or Hispanics would be willing to move into neighborhoods right. that were very racially mixed. And you found a very different response when you're dealing with Anglos, with whites, moving into neighborhoods that are mixed. Would you talk about that a bit? You bet. Yeah. So, so we said, supposing you're looking for a new house, and you find one that has everything you've been looking for, it's, it's, it's within your price range. And then as you explore the neighborhood more, you discover that the schools are of high quality, that the property values are, are going up, and the, and the community is, and then we randomly said, 10% 10, 10, 10 black and 90% and Anglo, 30% black and 70% Anglo, 60% black and 40% and Anglo, how likely would you be to buy that house? And so it was each question what it was randomly distributed among, among the respondents. And you discover among Blacks and Latinos, it made no difference what, what the percentage in the neighborhood was as to the percentage who said they would, they would definitely buy that house because it had everything they were looking for. Among Anglos, it made a big difference. And it made a big difference. And it, it, the difference was just as great today as it was back in 2004 when we first asked that question, where Anglos was perfectly happy to buy a house that is in a neighborhood that's 10 percent or 30 percent uh, African American, but not when it was 60 percent. Neither African American or 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 uh, uh, Hispanic, but in, but they were perfectly willing to buy a house that was that was 60 percent Asian in the community. So there's a clear sort of resistance still in the psyches of Anglos about about African Americans and Latinos, and I think has more a class assumption than it, than it has a, I'm not objecting to black doctor, I'm objecting to black janitors. But it does remind us that there's still, that part of the residue of racism kind of comes not just structurally, but also in terms of our expectations, our perceptions of people, our, our sense of, of uh, assumptions that we make about people. That is a kind of reflection of, of our history. We're making great progress, but we have a long ways to go. And, and so I get yelled at a lot by, by my friends who say it isn't just a, a class divide. It's also very much a racial divide. And that's very real. And I come back and say, yes, you're right. It is. It's both. Uh, but, but class makes a big difference. And, and, and we're not going to solve our racial problems until we solve our, our inequality problems across the world. Is that the way you see it, that, that it's really going to require that we become more equal uh, for that change in race to happen? Yes, because the assumptions that we make about each other are predicated on the old beliefs that, you know, blacks are fine people, but, they, but they're, they're not capable of doing the kind of work that, that, that you know, our, my middle class comfort level. Sociologists talk about people want to live in communities made up of PLUs, People like us, right? Yes, exactly. And and that's 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 the, the challenge. But it's also it's also the new reality. Is that we're talking about the, about intermarriages? I mean, race becomes much much less relevant as we go forward. It's still there. It's still enormously important. But but there's this embrace of the diversity. There's this recognition of of the enrichment that comes from bringing, from people of different cultures. And it's the cities like Houston that are at the forefront of the demographic transformation that also are the most comfortable with this diversity. 
and the most they're ready to embrace it. Uh, and, and that's an interesting piece of, of basis for optimism, I think, as well. And the other big place, place for optimism, as we mentioned, younger Anglos are totally comfortable with the reality that older Anglos are struggling with. We older Anglos grew up in the 60s and 70s. That was a different world in America than the world of the 1990s and 2000s. There's a law of human nature that says, what I am familiar with feels right and natural. What I'm unfamiliar with feels unnatural and somehow not quite right. And that's, and we're living at this time of fundamental transformation. So I tell people, you gotta be gentle with us old Anglos. This is a big change. But younger Anglos are saying, hey, this is what I love about America. This is who we are. And so there's room for some optimism there too, but it's, but there's lots of challenges that I have as we go forward. But you have seen that progress over the life of your survey in terms of attitudes about race. Just absolutely clear, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That, that does give room for some optimism. It's, it's, for, it does suggest that, that Houston has a real chance to be a model for what all of America can be, as all of America ends up looking like Houston in about 25 to 30 years. Now, I want to mention a couple of the questions that were turned in to us, and, and here's a good one. Um, it says, you observe that, quote, few exemplify more clearly than Houston the trends that are refashioning the social and political landscape across the nation. How do we continue to be a learning laboratory for the rest of the nation, but in a positive way? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, we need to become a learning society. We need to, uh, we need to emphasize education from, from birth to college, from cradle to career. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the story of, uh, of the, the new global knowledge-based economy of the 21st century. So all these things are, are, are central and are open questions. You know, we're not yet doing all we've been talking about that we, that we need to do. The United Way is just so critical because it is precisely addressing those inequalities and, and recognizing, as we all now increasingly recognize, people need a hand up. They need some help. They, there, there are structural barriers that keep you from, there's concentrated poverty that, that multiplies the, the, the lack of opportunity that exists in, in minority communities across across the city. And we need to address those because that's our future. And, and it's that striking reality that Anglos are disproportionately overrepresented among the older folks. We've been said until, you're, until 63 years old or older that the majority of folks are still Anglos. And the young people are disproportionately non-Anglo. Uh, that's, that's the story of America, nowhere more clearly seen than in Houston. And that's that great challenge because it, it's the future that, that, that census figure that says of everybody under 20 across the entire Harris County, of everybody under 20, 70% are African American Latino and 21% are Anglos. Wow. That's. Yeah. That's the Houston story, and, and we have enormous opportunity to, to but you know, the other thing I keep saying is that, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, no force in the world is going to stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more African-American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo. Nothing in the world can stop that. This could be the greatest asset that Houston could have or it could tear us apart. And so that's the question, and, and again, it comes back to what we were saying earlier, that future depends on us now, on the decisions that we make today, on the investments that we're willing to make. And again, I think one, one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of United Way is that they are recognizing that and they are speaking to that. And they are saying, we need to pour more resources into that process of ensuring that this diversity does indeed become the great asset and doesn't end up tearing us apart. Well, as we talk about that prophetic city and how Houston has become that, I do want to talk about two major events that have happened in the last few months after your book was published, uh, uh, but will have no doubt a major effect on your next surveys. Uh, first of all, the coronavirus pandemic, of course. As a city, we have so many advantages. We've got the Texas Medical Center. We have a, an incredible medical core, if you will. Uh, yet we were dealing with issues of testing and capacity and a wildly unequal system of medical uh, care and access. That's the key point. Care. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and so we saw played out here what is happening around the country and, and probably around the world. How does that reflect on our prophetic city and what do we do to make things better down the road? Because medical care and access is going to continue to be an even bigger issue. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, what, what, what this pandemic has done is to, is to 
underline the tremendous inequalities, the, the vulnerabilities of African Americans and Latinos who are who are doing those jobs where where they have to interact with others who are who are living in much more crowded quarters who can't telecommute to work in the way that upper middle class folks can. And, and, and especially we touched on, we have the greatest medical complex in the world. Houston has the highest percentage of children without health insurance of any major city in the country. And all of that was laid bare by the tremendous inequalities of, of, of vulner, that inequalities in, in vulnerabilities across the board in, in the city. And, and that's a big part of, of what has happened. And it's, it's, it's a deep disgrace for America to be have the highest, the, the, the least effective effort, uh, ability to, to address these issues, partly because of the great inequalities, partly because of this crazy degree to which we have politicized the wearing of masks. Absolutely crazy. I mean, it just makes no sense whatsoever, uh, but is a part of the political polarization that, that makes it, that, that paralyzes the country in many ways to be able to address the issues and, and to, to be the, 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 the effective city that addresses its problems um, and and leads the rest of the world in in, in those in, in, in addressing those realities we've been way behind in, in ways that are that ought to be a, a wake-up call and i think is to some degree a wake-up call for america well and the second issue we've been talking about of course is race and the protests that we've seen all around the nation and the world including right here which was really ground zero since george floyd was a houstonian yes. um, but we've also seen more diversity among the protesters as you mentioned more whites hispanics asians younger uh, from from very young to very old um, and we have battled in race in our city since the very beginning but what did you see in terms of these protests did you see any hope there and what do you take from that that sort of applies to for the future of American cities. Yeah, great. Well, one of the things that, of course, is going to be very interesting, go back in, in our survey in January and February of next year to be able to ask some of these same questions and see how much have we changed. But one of the ways in which I think we have changed, or at least where you can see the change, is as we were touching on earlier, this is not just blacks protesting against the inhumanity against a, a black prisoner. This is all of us. This, this, is, this was tremendous reckoning. You know, that, that, and this could be one of the sea changes that happens in Houston and in America. And when the realities of what we have, who we are, hits in a way that is un undeniable and unmistakable. And, and, and that picture, eight, those eight and a half minutes of that me on, on, on George Floyd's neck when he was calling for help and calling for his mother. I mean, it was just remarkable, unbelievable sort of in America in 20, in, in, in 2020, this is the reality that, that people face in, at the hands of the police. I mean, that, so how that will play out and, and whether this is going to be one of the, one of the forces that Houstonians will look, historians will look back on and say, this was a big change. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see as we go forward. I mean, we're in, a, in a, a, a world of flux and again, lots of room for optimism and lots of room for pessimism and concern. And so it's part of why it's it's worth following these things, and I've been very much sort of uh, impressed by the degree to which objective social science data are helpful in in asking how are we changing. Each of us interacts with people, and PLUs, people like us, people people who agree with us. It's very valuable to get a representative random sample of all of us and say we are changing. We are seeing the world differently today than we did, and there is room for some hope as we go forward together to address those questions and to, and to make a better world, to, to, to make that more perfect union that, that, that all of us have been talking about for so many years. Well, Stephen, I do want to ask you about some of the important work that the United Way is doing right now to deal with many of the very same issues uh, you've been talking about in our city, the needs that we have. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I think we mentioned that the United Way is right at the forefront of, of addressing those those fundamental realities, the deep inequalities that people cannot solve all by themselves. It require uh, investments and support systems. Uh, and the, the vision for the second century is just a powerful document of, of recognizing the number of people who are working full time in Houston, unable to earn enough money to support their families, uh, the greatest medical complex in the world, and 25% of everybody in Houston has no health insurance. 
uh, striking sort of inequalities that, that call on all of us together to help provide those opportunities for, for all of us in the city. And, and the only way has been leading the way on that. And that second century vision is a powerful picture with the, with the, of helping people reach self-sustainability, Re recognizing that it takes a set of steps to finally be able to earn enough money to support the family and to, and to get health insurance through the employers and, and other ways and, and, and making sure that we have the support systems that enable their kids to succeed in the public school system so that they're prepared for the jobs of the 21st century. All of that together is a big part of what United Way has focused on and has led the way in as we, as, and is critical to all of us as we go forward you know, in today's world. And you think that's a great example for so many other cities around the country. Oh, you bet. And, and, and what's so interesting is, of course, we can learn from other cities as well. Every city, in many ways, is dealing with these very same problems. Houston is particularly sharp because of the sudden collapse of the oil boom and this, this new economy where education suddenly become critical. And the demographic revolution that has turned us into a, a, a picture of what all of America is, is turning into in the 21st century. I've got to ask you, with all the changes we've seen in the last um, few months, what questions will you be asking for the next survey? Because it's probably going to have uh, to reflect a lot of that. Well, that's going to be a fascinating time. Right? We're in the midst of a triple whammy, as they call it, with, with this pandemic that is creating enormous hardship and, and, and deaths and, and disease across the board with a shutdown of the economy that has got to be shut down further and more rigidly if we're going to get control over the pandemic. And of course, the collapse of oil prices that is central to the Houston economy still today. We're no longer 80% of us involved in the oil business, but 35% of us are involved in the oil business. Uh, so how, we, how, how will we have dealt with the next eight months? It will be fascinating to watch as we go into the field in January and February of 2021, asking some of the identical questions we've asked before so we can measure the changes, and then the new questions that will emerge, especially having to, what we talked earlier, the, the, the new sensitivity to structural racism in America and the terrible uh, inequalities in the way the, the police uh, deal, deal with, with um, perpetrators of various sorts. So, so all of that will be fascinating to watch. This is maybe the most interesting and consequential city in America. I feel enormously privileged to be able to, to do these surveys over these years. And who knew that this would be the most interesting city in, in the country as well? You've been at this now, as you uh, are so happy to say, 38 years, almost oh. years. <laughs> Truly your life's work, anybody's life's work. And what is next for you? Uh, I don't know. I know it's for the next year. Uh, if, if we're going to uh, eventually I'll retire uh, and, and we'll see. But, but uh, this has been such a privilege for me. And, it's, and this is such a great city. And, the, and again, the greatness of the city lies in the people of, of Houston. And I'm looking forward to spending more time with friends. And, and, and but retirement has not yet uh, come into the come into the, the, the vision, uh, but it will eventually. And meanwhile, having a great time and 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 happy to finally get this book out. I mean, this I tell people I've been only working on this book for 38 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I hope you won't mind, but I'm also going to say. Happy 80th birthday to you. Everybody out there who didn't know, you just turned 80. And we, we couldn't be happier for you. So in cyberspace, let me just give you a, a thank you. big applause. Thank you. And thank, thank, you. thank you so, so much, much for doing this. You know, I always relish a chance to sit and chat with you. And this has been one of our best conversations. So thank you so much for that. And thank you. on behalf of United Way and everybody who is uh listening to this, we want to thank you for your time and for your extraordinary insight over these nearly four decades. Thank you. Oh, you bet, Billy. Thank you for everything that you're doing. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, Dr. Kleinberg, thank you so much for a fascinating conversation this morning. I could ask so many more questions, but we are just about out of time. We want to thank you for taking so much time this morning to share such rich information on Houston's history, our values, our beliefs, and your insights for the future, and they have been so spot on. We look forward already to hearing the results of your next study, especially with all the new information you will have. And best success with your book. It really is a must read for anybody interested in reading about the future of uh, cities and urban development and not just Houston. Uh, we know how much broader your uh, 
your insights are in terms of how our country is developing. So thank you again. And now it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Armando Perez, who is the Executive Vice President of HEB Houston and the United Way of Greater Houston's Board Chair. Armando? Thank you, Melanie, for moderating our conversation with Dr. Kleinberg this morning. Don't forget to watch Melanie on ABC 13 nightly. Stephen, while your book was 38 years in the making, it was well worth that wait. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your historical perspective on Houston's journey to growth, how we have changed, and your hope for our future. I'm sure that everyone listening in today will be inspired to go read your book. We will certainly be looking forward to seeing next year's survey and the changes captured given our current state of affairs. Thank you again, Stephen. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for all you do for the United Way and our community every day. As our 2020-2021 community campaign gets underway, we are acutely aware of the challenges so many of our neighbors are facing as a result of the impacts of this pandemic. Your generous and steadfast support means so much to United Way of Greater Houston and all of those that we serve. Thank you to our Caring Champion sponsors who make many of our events throughout the year, including this one possible. Have a great day and stay safe. <laughs>